Greetings and welcome to In Depth. I'm DK Rostar. It is time for part two of our conversation with the Chief Public Defender, Hasina Sheikh. Looking forward to it. So in the first conversation, Ms. Sheikh, we spoke about, well, I spoke about still trying to wrap my mouth around PDD versus DPP. So I, I think I want to start off with the relationship. Is it that members of each grouping, when you all see each other, you all cross the road or what? What? what is that? What, is, what is that relationship like? It's actually quite a cordial one, usually. A number of us would have gone to school together. We would have gone, you know, on different parts. Some of us went into prosecution. Some of us went into defense. But ultimately, it is a cordial relationship. We know each other separate and apart outside of the courtroom. And we have to work together to get things done. So it is important to have a good working relationship. And essentially, we are two arms of a three-part process because, you know, without the prosecutor and the defense attorney, and then, of course, the court itself, we wouldn't be able to accomplish what needs to be done. So I think our relationship is pretty good and we continue to work on it. And is there a matter of who are some of the other stakeholders that help to provide, well, help to scaffold the system of those three partners and the interplay between them? There are a number. I mean, the police service, of course, is a big, a big stakeholder because they are the persons who do the investigative arm of the state. Then you have the prisons, especially now since prisoners are not brought directly to the courts if they're in custody. They operate out of the facilities at the prison. They are also a very important stakeholder, separate and apart from housing the prisoners. They also are responsible for essentially bringing them to court. So that is important. For those persons who have... Um, potential mental issues. We work very closely with the psychiatric hospitals as well. So there are a number of stakeholders that actually make all of this work. And I like the fact that, and I'm going to try to stop harkening to the first conversation, but the, the public defend, well, the PDD was formed during, or it came about during COVID, March, 2020. And you said naturally COVID or the pandemic would have not necessarily stymied, but challenged some of the efforts or the work of the PDD. Now that we are looking, hopefully, at the tail end of COVID, things have relaxed considerably. Yes. How does a day look differently? For Is it a matter of going into prisons, checking on, on individuals at points in time? What does that day look like because of the, the fact that these restrictions have been lifted? Oh, I mean, a day in a, in a life of a public defender is quite busy. So separate and apart from, so we still kept the virtual system because it made sense. There is no reason to go and sit down at the prison and spend your entire day in commuting and waiting if it could actually be done virtually. So we have continued to use that system. The only time that we would actively go into prison is if there is a requirement that really needs us to do so. So meaning that we're heading straight into trial, we need to get particular things from them. If we need to do that, we will go to the prison for it. But our day to day in terms of taking the instructions and dealing with progressing the matter, we try to do that virtually. So there's that prison aspect of it, which takes up a considerable amount of time because we have to communicate with our clients. Then, of course, you have court. I mean, in terms of most of our attorneys are in, are in active trials. So there, there's a combination between judge alone, which has hybrid circumstances where sometimes it's done in person and online or a bit of the both, depending. And then, of course, you have jury trials that have resumed, which requires them to go to court and, and for the jury to be present and you go through that process. But separate and apart from that, the public defenders also process all of the applications for legal aid in the criminal arena. So any person at the court that, you know, whether it's by virtue of a court request, whether it comes from the prison itself, all of the persons who are currently in the prison who request legal aid, we process that, those applications. 
And then there are always other segments of what we do as well. We contribute significantly to legislation in terms of providing comments and reviews. We participate in joint select committees. We we have significant training. We do have training at least once a month. It's often a lot more than that. So the public defender has a quite a busy schedule. I must say that. And take me through that training a little bit. Thank you. In terms of what are some of those things that are needed in terms of building the capacity of, of the grouping to ensure that you provide the best service, the best representation that is possible? So it's it's training it are a number of different components. So sometimes we would focus on what we consider to be specialized training. So things that we do not have the requisite knowledge and know-how just by virtue of being a teeny. So for example, whether it be ballistics, whether it be forensics, those are things that we would not know off the top of our head. So we do ask the experts to give us training for that. And we found that to be particularly beneficial so that when we're confronted with these things in court, we're we're better equipped to deal with it. And then of course there are other elements. So we do focus on what we consider to be trial advocacy. An attorney, you know, we see on Law and Order and all of these wonderful shows that an attorney shows up in court and they, they sound wonderful. But really and truly, it's practice and know-how and, and that knowledge base that also allows you to get that. So we do have trial advocacy training, which we have engaged in through our various stakeholders. And that has been another element of training. And then, of course, there are the theoretical areas. Every time a new piece of legislation comes out, every time a new case comes out that has changed the landscape of what it was before, those are also areas that require training because it means that we all need to be on the same page. And there are two things, I mean, and I appreciate the entire answer, but there are two things that really stood out to me. One, the practical nature of being able to, I guess, perform. Because it's one thing to be able to say, okay, well, you're not wowed, you're able to function under that duress, because it's literally someone's life that you are working to represent, and their future may be hinging upon your performance or in, in their representation. So being able to do that, looking at those consequences is very different from, okay, well, you're at a moot, at a, at hewoding. So being able to build those reps and build the capacity, I think, is something that's very important, as well as looking at the repercussions of new legislation, new precedents that are coming out. And with that in mind, uh, have there been any changes in precedents since or possibly as a result of the work of the PDD? So what we tend to do is we observe what's happening before the courts very carefully. So we have had at least two situations where we would have participated in as interested parties. So one was a case that dealt with DNA and how what direction should be given to the jury well, the fact finders, be once you're dealing with a matter for DNA. So we would have participated in that case and provided what I think would have been helpful um, information and research that we thought would have assisted the court in coming to its decision. And we also participated in a recent case um, that came up at the Court of Appeal in terms of bail for murder and where the jurisdiction lied. And we also provided significant submissions in that respect. So for us, we think that when there are areas that need assistance and that are uh, that could potentially change the landscape, we do try to make ourselves available and to assist the court. And going back to processing applications, how do you match an application to an attorney within the department? So once an application, we process the application at the prison or if they were to come in and physically fill out the application, once that is done, it is then sent to the relevant judicial court, meaning that it would go either to a judicial officer at the magistrate's court or it would go to a judicial officer at the high court level. They would issue what is considered to be a certificate of legal aid saying that this person has been a judge to be fit for legal aid. Once that comes back to us, we would request the documents essentially for the high court level. 
for the magisterial level, there are no documents, and those matters are dealt with by the private persons who make up our external panel, and it's essentially briefed out to them at the magisterial level. But at the high court level, we do have the documents, which we call the deposition, which would have been the evidence that the state is essentially relying on, and which would have been the documents that came out of the magistrate's court. So once we see those documents, we're able to look at it you know, see what the issues are, see the complexity of the matter. And then based on the experience and level of the attorneys at the department, we would either assign to them and sometimes it may not stay within the department for a number of reasons. And we would ex and we would assign it externally. Yeah, that's interesting. Actually, that's something that we may come back to when we return from the break. But we're speaking with the chief public defender, Haseen Sheikh. Stay with us. We'll return with more. Welcome back. We are speaking with the Chief Public Defender, Haseen Sheikh, looking at the work of the Public Defender's Department. And March 2020, I keep harking back to the to the to the day or to the date rather. Looking at reducing backlog. So you mentioned only printing paper when it is necessary and it can be is is really mind-boggling sometimes on that single point. Because there's so many repercussions for that, being able to function wherever you are getting that information accessed versus the isolated, say, okay, well, the paper's here, so you need to get them from here. Or if, or if you're getting them copied, you need to copy them from this place. And remind us of some of the other things that have been entrenched from the get-go uh, to reduce backlog and and some of the actions of the PDD in terms of helping to do that task? Of course. So, as I said, we would have changed that that system. So we would have gone to that process of being digital. Then we also would have, as I said before as well, in terms of implementing training. So we're more effectively dealing with subject matter so that we're not just trying to, you know, delay matters we're trying to ensure that we move it even that process of terms of being able to actively assign matters in an efficient manner and choosing in terms of complexity and deciding who are the best persons it means that instead of having a revolving door of reassignments which used to be the case before it means now that when an attorney gets a matter it's something that they can do and that they're able to do it before the courts are able to move it faster and then of course identifying where there are accused persons who wish to plead guilty and not going to trial because not every single matter requires a trial. And just being able to identify that at an early stage is also very important. And you just, those I, that itemized list makes me wonder what are some of the measures that you use to define success? So how do you go about saying, yes, we've done what we wanted to for this week, for this month, for this period of time? What defines success? Well, what defines success for us is ensuring that we're providing quality representation, ensuring that, an, a, pers that a person who is brought before the courts gets representation within the confines of the law and they get the best possible defense that is available to them. It certainly does not mean that it's always or not guilty. And I have to be very clear about that because that is the perception but not guilty is not a measure of success for us. It is essentially ensuring that we provide that quality representation. And are there levels of, because I like the fact that you talk about it's not just not guilty. And looking at the fact that you can have persons plead, uh, are there also possibilities for restorative justice? Is that something that the PDD looks at? How does that factor into the work that you do? 
So in terms of, especially with the persons who plead, because a number of persons unfortunately find themselves in the remand system for a number of years. On average, a person is on remand for a, for a capital matter for murder, essentially for just about 10 years, and that's the lower end. We've had quite a number up to recently, up to 17 years, and they've not even had a trial. So what we really do look at in terms of when we are engaging in police, what have they done in the prison? What has been available to them? What programs can we get them in? How can we encourage them to come back out into society and be a productive member of society? So that is something that we have been actively looking at and also looking to see in terms of what level of partnerships that we can engage in. So there, there are NGOs who work within the prison, one of them being Vision on a Mission. And they do have programs for pre-release where they basically try to get skills and into these persons who are going to be released soon. So we try as much as possible to enroll our clients into those programs and basically be able to ensure that when they come out, that we are not just walking, they're not walking outside without a skill. They are going to be able to come out and hopefully we don't have to see them again. And that brings into mind the revolving door that we have we, we have mentioned sometimes in conversations like this. But naturally, not trying to go into specifics, but in terms of feedback, uh, is there any feedback that you get either from individuals themselves or from some of the, the NGOs that you would have just uh, intimated that the public defender's department is really making a difference? Are there in, in, in individuals who are on that lower end, 10 years or 17 years for capital for crimes? Uh, is there feedback that you they say, yes, we've, we're grateful that this department exists and is helping to represent us? Well, I would like to say that, you know, the clients themselves do express their gratitude. But, you know, separate and apart from clients expressing their gratitude, I think the biggest um indication of feedback is the fact that there are other persons within the prison system who specifically ask for us. And I think that in and of itself is a testament to the fact that they have recognized that we are working and working well and actively participating in ensuring that matters are dealt with. Because I think delay is a serious issue and that is ultimately what has gotten us to this point in the first place. So if they know that they have 29 attorneys who are only doing their matters because they have no other work to do in terms of they're not dealing with private matters, they're not concerned about whether they're making their overheads and rent and they have fixed salaries and that their focus is the client is that person who is before the court. I think that has put us in a better position so that they see that wholeheartedly. And that may lead to the question, if we take, if we make the presumption that yes, the public defender's department is necessary, give the rationale why is the public defender's department necessary for the, and I say the criminal justice system. I think the Public Defenders Department has stepped in and essentially filled that gap of ensuring that we can have dedicated attorneys who are dealing with these matters in such a manner that it's efficient, effective, and reducing that backlog. I think it has. we have basically shown it by what we're doing, and then it just means in terms of just how we move forward. If we were not there, the criminal bar is very small. So then we will be back to a system where we don't have enough attorneys to service the sheer number of matters before the court. So whether I think we're important, absolutely. Are we deserving of being a major stakeholder? I think we've definitely earned our keep. And in terms of doing that, is not the first time after you've mentioned moving forward. So in terms of moving forward, let's say about three years, what are some of those things that you'd like to see, especially if you say, okay, well, the Public Defenders Department is this major player, this stakeholder, it has the seat at the table. What are some of those things that you're hoping to see way from where you are now to where you want to be in about three years? What I'm 
I mean, there are a number of things I'm hoping for. Let me try to identify the most urgent ones. I think what we need to do is have a conversation about categorization of murder because currently the death penalty is on the table and that's the only penalty that is available. And that poses problems because we have a number of persons who wish to plead guilty, but they cannot. And if we have that process of categorization of murder, that may make that process a lot easier and assist in resolving that backlog. I think we also need to work towards ensuring that we have more rehabilitation um, considered in the sentencing process. I think that's a very important element that, you know, because what happens is that we get the newspaper headlines, Mark, man walks free after pleading guilty. But it's not that the man has walked free. The man has served 15 to 17 years in some cases and did not have a trial, but chose to plead guilty. And because of the time served, he has essentially served a sentence. And I think that we need to focus on rehabilitation because persons should not be on remand for that length of time without having access to a number of programs, especially these skills that we want them to come back out towards. So that would be something that I would really like us to see that we work towards, not just within the public defenders department, but to make it part of our sentencing so that we're able to treat with that more effectively. And then, of course, use the plea bargaining legislation more effectively so that we identify at an earlier stage that a person is able to plead guilty, is willing to plead guilty, and then we move them from that remand section into the convicted section. I think that's important so that we at least have the earliest disposal of the matter. And with that, I want to thank you so much, Ms. Haseen Sheikh, Chief Public Defender, looking at what are some of these things, pulling back or peeling back the curtains a little bit. Hopefully this is not the only conversation we have, but I want to thank you so much for the work that you and your department continue to do. And on behalf of the entire TTT News team, this has been In-Depth with me, DK Ronstan. Thank you so much for joining us.